I was riding home from chapel this morning, had WTBI on the radio, and the man was cheerfully giving the weather forecast for the end of the week, and I said, thank God I won't be here for that. <laughs> Little did I know. <laughs> Amen. What a joy. I looked up tonight, and a young lady from our church had come all this way to hear me preach. I saw her walk in the door. I moved things away so she could sit with me, and she walked right past me and went and sat somewhere else. That's not that sad. That's, that's, that's really sad. Just, just get moved aside. That's all right. I still love her. She's still a blessing. I'm going to tell her, Daddy. <laughs> Hurt my feelings. Don't even know if I can preach tonight. It's just... Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, Annie's a blessing. We, good girl, loves Jesus, used to love me. <laughs> Luke chapter 15, I'm going to preach four sermons tonight. Oh, oh, oh. Three of them are short, one's, one's middle size. Three of them are good independent Baptist sermons. Complete, they'll be completely out of context. But it'd be good preaching. It just won't be. It just won't be right. <laughs> and then the fourth one. The fourth one will pull, pull everything back into context and 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 get it get it just right. I hope and, and pray. That's that's my desire. You know, aren't you glad we've got a savior? We're not looking to politicians and and people of this world. But but uh, you, and I don't want to. I don't. Try, I try not to get in politics when I'm when I'm in the pulpit. It just upsets people. But uh, you, you know, you you got these these. These government people, they don't seem to know what they're doing. And, and, and then every now and then, it, God will put somebody that has been in business all their life in office. And there was, I heard there was a, a big competition. Uh, Nancy Pelosi challenged Donald Trump to a fishing, ice fishing contest. And they flew up to Minnesota. And the first day, they both went out on the ice. And at the end of the day, uh, Donald Trump had 20 fish and Pelosi had none. And she's very angry about that. She said, well, I, I, double or nothing tomorrow. So they went out the next day out there on the ice, cold, cold up there in Minnesota. He caught 30 fish. She caught none. She said, one more time, one more time for all the marbles. Went out there, not, same thing. He caught 25 fish. She caught none. And they interviewed her afterwards, said, uh, how come you think he won? She said, he cheated. He cut a hole in the ice. That's politicians, you know. They, they, they can't seem to figure anything out. All right, Luke. Whoever you voted for, don't, don't get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. If you like voting, you ought to be a Democrat. You get to vote again and again and again. Just <laughs> Weeks after the election's over, you get to still keep voting until you, until you finally get that person across the finish line. Anyway, that just, just, if that upsets you, forget I ever said it. I say that at home a lot. <laughs> Wife, if that upsets you, just forget I ever said it. All right, Luke chapter number 15 tonight. Luke chapter 15. There are three parables in this chapter, and these three parables give us an incredible picture of how God saves sinners. And we believe as Christians, we believe in God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost. We believe there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. We believe that because it's in the King James Bible. If you don't have a King James Bible, you might not believe that because it's not in your Bible. 1 John 5, 7 is not in the modern versions, but in the Holy Bible, there are three that bear record, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You can't have one triangle if you don't have three sides. you got two sides, not a triangle. you got one side, it's not a triangle. If you don't have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, you don't have God, not the God of the Bible. You say, I don't understand that. I don't understand a lot of things. God didn't say, understand the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. And I can do that. I don't understand how, how the God that created heavens and the earth could come and live inside a little, a little baby body in, the, in a manger at Bethlehem. But I believe that. So anyway, in these three parables, the first one is about how God the Son, 
saves sinners. It's a beautiful picture. And the second is about how, how God the Holy Spirit saves sinners, and it's a beautiful picture. And the third is about how God the Father saves sinners, and it's a beautiful picture. And we'll look at all three of those together just as soon as we pray. Father, bless your word tonight to our hearts, and please, Lord, uh, help me to make these things clear to your people. Uh, bless their desire to be out in church uh, another night, four nights in a row already. And, and the enthusiasm, excitement, and the singing, what a blessing it must have been to your heart. We hope it was. We are, we, our desires that it was. And now, Lord, help us to thrill you by, by paying attention to your Bible and doing what it says. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, verse 3 says, And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he called together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Now, the Bible says that all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We're not sheep. We've gone astray like sheep do. Now, this, this sheep, it wandered away, it got lost, and it could not find its way back home. I, I'm no expert on these matters. I, I just dabbled in this long enough to know that my dabbling was not going to do me any good. But we have raised cattle, and we have raised chickens, and we have raised turkeys, and we have raised goats, and, and all of that, and we had one sheep. And I'm going to tell you something. When God called lost people and saved people. When he, when he said lost people like sheep and saved people are sheep, he was not paying you a compliment. Sheep are just dumb. I'm telling you, they are. You, you hear these stories all the time about somebody went on vacation, the dog jumped out of the car at the rest stop, and six months later the dog found its way home and flopped down on the front porch. Or you hear these stories about the cat ran away and the kids all cried, and three months later the cat came back home. You will never in your life hear a story like that about a sheep. That, those cows we had, they'd bust through that fence and get out in the woods, and they'd get hungry, they'd come home. Those goats, they'd wander off and go eat the neighbor's flowers and stuff like that, and they got tired of that, they'd come home. That sheep, we had driveway, 300 feet long, barbed wire down this side, barbed wire down that side. You can't turn to the right, you can't turn to the left. That sheep would wander down that driveway, stand in the road, looking at the house, hollering for somebody to come get it. It couldn't figure out how to walk back down the driveway. That's a sheep. When God said, all we like sheep have gone astray, he picked the one animal he made that will never, never find its own way home. That's you. If you're lost tonight, you will not find your way home through church, through religion, through good works, through turning over new leaves. A shepherd's going to have to come find you where you are and bring you back. I'm so glad the Lord Jesus Christ came looking for me. I wasn't looking for him. I wasn't searching for him. I he, he just, he just came, came after me out there lost. And when he did, listen, when, he found, when that shepherd found that sheep, he didn't take that rod and staff and beat that sheep with it for causing him so much trouble. He didn't kick it real good one time, just let it know how displeased he was with it. That shepherd knelt down where that sheep was and put his arms up under that sheep and lifted that thing up and put it on his shoulders. Isn't that an amazing thing? He didn't say to that sheep, follow me and I'll get you home. He didn't say to that sheep, now you keep up and don't wander off again. To make sure that sheep never wandered away a second time, he put it on his shoulders and praise God, he didn't put it down till he got home. Praise the Lord. Jesus Christ not only came after you if you're saved, came after me. He not only stooped down to where we were, he not only lifted us up and put us on his shoulders, but praise God, he'll not put us down until he gets us all the way home. Praise the Lord. What a blessing. What a blessing. That's a beautiful picture of how the Lord saves a sinner. It's not at all what he's talking about. That's completely out of context. But it's pretty good preaching, isn't it? Pretty good, pretty good picture. All right, look at verse number eight. Either, what woman having 10 pieces of silver? Now, that's the girl you want to, you uh, if, you're not, if you're not married, 
Uh, that's a girl to, to be interested in. She's not broke. She got 10, 10 pieces of silver. How about that? Boy, I'd like a girl like that. She'd buy me a car and all kinds of stuff. I thought, what woman have 10 pieces of silver? She lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. Well, let's reconsider that. Because if that girl drops a coin on the floor and can't see it for the dust, <laughs> she's probably not somebody you want to marry. <laughs> Sister, you drop a quarter on the floor and can't see it, you need to turn off the TV. <laughs> that's, that house, that's house a mess, man. So anyway, she, she gets a candle and she gets a broom and she sweeps the house and she seeks diligently till she finds it. And when she had found it, she called her friends or neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now look at that coin. That coin, like that sheep, it's lost. But this coin is lost because of the carelessness and inattention of someone else. That coin didn't jump out of her pocketbook and throw itself on the floor. That coin didn't slide off the countertop and, 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 and jump off that, off that ledge. That, this, somebody's being careless here. Somebody committed an error that caused that coin to fall. You know something, before I ever knew what sin was, I was a sinner. Before I ever knew what I was doing wrong, I was doing wrong because in Adam, in Adam, all die. By one man's sin, death entered the world, and, 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 and sin passed, passed upon all men. Death passed upon all men for the law of sin. I, I fell before I knew I was fallen, and quite honestly, it was, it was because of somebody else. Now, I've committed plenty of my own sins, but, but down I went, and, and, and then look at that coin. It didn't fall halfway and then hit the brakes. It didn't fall three quarters of the way and then stop. When that coin fell, it fell all the way until it hit the bottom. You know what that is? That's a picture of you, my sinner friend. Let me tell you something. It, it's so, this world doesn't understand this. Can, can I? I'm going to get off track just for a second. The reason people get so offended when you witness to them, when you tell them you know you're going to heaven and they're not, you know why they get so angry with you? Because they think people get to heaven by their good works. So when you tell them you know you're going to heaven, they think you're saying, I'm good enough to go to heaven, but you're not. Amen. That's why they get offended. You've got to explain to them. All of sin that comes short of going, that includes me. There's not, a, not one righteous, that includes me. When, listen, so here's what I want to say. There's a boy sitting here tonight, eight years old. He is as guilty before God as a murderer. There's a girl here tonight, seven years old. She's as guilty before God as a bank robber. The Lord didn't say all have sinned a lot or all have sinned a little or all have sinned some. He said all have sinned, that's it. That coin fell and it hit the bottom and every sinner that's fallen has hit the bottom. You've got to be saved, not when you get bad enough, not when you've gone far enough, not when you've done enough terrible things. No, everybody's got to get saved because compared to the holiness of God, everybody's hit the bottom. Now, as soon as that coin, look, as soon as that coin hit the ground, the dirt and the debris and the dust, it conspired together to cover that coin. Isn't that an amazing thing? You didn't go out here, young man, when you were 16, 17, 18 years old. You didn't go out here and say, I'm going to get in all the sin I can get in. I'm going to get in all the world's mess I can get in. You didn't have to do that. You got your first job, and here came the cuss words, and here came the dirty pictures, and here come the reprobate minds. Amen. You go, you go off out there and, 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 and work in that world. You don't have to say, hey, sin, come and get me. Boy, it's all around. It's all around. It, it's coming in through the ear gate. It's coming in through the eye gate. It's pounding at us from every direction. And that coin, it's not just lost. It's lost where it seems no one could ever find it. Amen. But guess what? Somebody came after it. Somebody missed it. Somebody said nine coins are not enough. I want the tenth. 
and went out there, and, and, and who went after that coin? Listen, it's a woman, and she got a candle, and she got a broom. Stay with me. It's a woman, and she got a candle, and she got a broom. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord is like a candle searching the inward parts of a man. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says the church is the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe that? I believe that. So what do you got? You got a woman laboring with a broom, but you got a candle shining its light. If that woman had swept with that broom in the dark corners of that house and there had been no candle, she might have swept the dirt away and exposed the coin, but she'd have never seen it. If that woman had shined that light in the very spot where the coin was but hadn't taken the broom to sweep the dirt away, she would have never seen that coin. You know what the Bible says in Revelation 22? The Spirit and the bride say come. Not the spirit without the bride, not the bride without the spirit, but the spirit and the bride say come. The woman needed the broom, but the woman needed the candlelight. Now, now stay with me. I, I'm not going to, I, I don't want to try to cause a, cause a big controversy here tonight, but if we do, we do. I, I agree, I agree with those who say, if the Holy Spirit doesn't move on a man, if the Holy Spirit doesn't convict a man, if the Holy Spirit doesn't draw a man, if the Holy Spirit doesn't show a man he's lost, I agree with all that. And then there's a side over here that says, if we don't get out there and work, if we don't get out there and labor, if we don't get out there and knock on doors, if we don't get out there and preach on the street, if we don't get out there and sing downtown, nobody's going to get saved. Which one's right? They're both right. Listen, we got programs and, and little books, three steps, and, and we go through all these evangelistic programs. All that energy can be total flesh with no work of the Holy Spirit and nothing lasting or genuine will come of it. And then we got these people saying, well, we just need to pray for God to move and we never go outside these walls and we never labor and we never work. And that's not, that's not going to do the job. What's it take? It takes the light of God's Holy Spirit and the labor of God's Holy Church working together to sweep the dirt away and shine the gospel light. That candle didn't float through the air. That woman had to carry it. The Holy Spirit's not out there. The Holy Spirit's in the believer. The only way the Holy Spirit can convict someone of sin is if the people in whom the Holy Spirit lives say something. So the Holy Spirit uh, saves the sinner by working through the labors of the bride. Praise the Lord. Now look at this third parable. Look at look, that, that, it, it, That's a good picture, isn't it? Completely out of context. It's not what Jesus is talking about, but it's a good picture. Verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me and before I read the next phrase, there are many hurtful things said in the Bible from one person to another. I don't think there's a more hurtful phrase in the Bible than the one you just read. You know when a, you know when a, a man gets his inheritance from his father? When his father's dead. This boy came to his father and said, give me everything you're going to give me when you're dead because you are dead to me. I have no intention of ever speaking to you again. I have no intention of ever sitting at your table again. I have no intention of ever enjoying your company again. I just want your stuff and then I'm out of here. What a hurtful thing to say. And what a picture of the sinner. You know what we want? We want God's sunshine, this world. They want God's sunshine. They want God's rain. They want God to stop the wars. They want God to give them a job. They want God to heal their child. And when they get everything they can get from God, they don't want to talk to him. They don't want to fellowship with him. They don't want him sticking his nose in their business. Every lost sinner out there is like this prodigal son. They want God's blessing, but they don't want God. And so what's he do? He says, Father, give me the portion of goods, fall to me. He divided on them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. You say, how much money do you think his daddy gave him? Not enough. Not enough. 
Hear me, young man. You're going to, one, one of these days, you're going to have your own set of car keys. One of these days, you're going to have your own wheels. One of these days, you're going to have your own apartment. One of these days, you're going to have your own income. You can go wherever you want out there in that world, but I'm telling you, you leave this place and go out in the world, you can't take enough money with you to find satisfaction. You can't take enough money with you to find happiness. You can't take enough money with you to find what you're looking for because it's here, it's not out there. He spent everything he had and turned up empty. So I don't know. I'm thinking about as soon as I'm old enough, I'm going to get out of this church and get out there in that world. Been there. Nothing out there. Tried it. Nothing out there. Looked under every rock. Nothing under. You may as well stay right here in the Father's house. The Bible says when he spent all he had, when he spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. What a picture of the lost sinner. You know what you just read about? You just read about a man who's jealous of pigs. He, he's standing there looking in the, in the hog pen. He said, I wish I was a pig. Those pigs have a better life than I have. That's pretty low down, isn't it? You know what our young people do? They look at these filthy, fornicating, drug-addicted, booze-drinking singers and movie stars and TV personalities and sports figures and say, I wish I was him. I wish I was her. Why would you be jealous of a pig? Why would you stand looking in a hog pen and say, I wish I was one of them? People making, making a, a, a name for themselves and our country holds them up as a celebrity because they do what? Take pictures of themselves without the clothes on? What a pig. Because they walk around with the pants halfway between their waist and their kneecaps and, and, and shout profanities and curse words and insults at police officers and decent people. What a bunch of pigs. Young people, don't be jealous of pigs. Good thing you told them we're extending before I said that. You already committed. Some of you said you're coming back tomorrow night. I'll tell you this world, you sit there in front of that internet, you say, I wish I had his life. I wish I had her life. I wish I was that person. I wish I was that person. You wouldn't wish that if you knew what, what their, their kinfolk know about them. You wouldn't know that if you knew what their neighbors knew about them. Why are you, why are you surprised that some, some drugged up, steroided up, ball player slaps a woman around. Why does that surprise you? Why does it surprise you some, some rock and roll singer has a drug overdose? Why does that surprise you? Why does it surprise you one of these, these women that, that, that flaunts herself and, 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 and just goes from man to man to man, ends up taking her life? Why does that surprise you? Those are desperate, dirty, terrible, filthy lives. It's only somebody's turned their back on the Father's house and given everything they had to the world and come up empty that looks at that and says, I wish I had that. Amen. Man, I'd rather be right here tonight and be out there in that world. Amen. We go down to Orlando, Florida and those places and stand in front of those bars and those nightclubs and, and preach and those people coming in and out of there uh, with, with their boyfriends and their girlfriends and somebody else's husband, somebody else's wife and they got their beer in their hand and shooting their drugs up in their arm and they make fun of us and they mock us and they ridicule us. I'm telling you, I have no, no desire at all to set my big toe inside the door of one of those pig pens. So I, I wouldn't go out there and preach. I might be tempted to go in those places. Why would you be tempted to go in there? Nothing in there but hog slop. Sows and boars snorting around. Young people, young people, you want to look up to somebody and say, I wish I was, I was, look up to a preacher, look up to a missionary, look up to a godly man or a godly woman with a happy home and a sound mind and a clean life. Don't stand outside a hog pen saying, I wish I had what they have. All they got slop. 
Well, that's pretty bad life. People addicted to the internet, look at, looking in there at people, people slop and, and saying, well, they got more than I got. I wouldn't admit that if I was you. <laughs> if all they got is slop and I got less than that, I wouldn't tell anybody. I'd get to Jesus, what I'd do. Anyway, that's a little side trip there. And when he came to himself, because nobody else is going to come to him, <laughs> he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? You know what he finally realized? It's better in the father's house than it is out here. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. You know what he said on his way out? Give me. You know what he said on his way back? Make me. Make me. He went from what can the father give me to what does the father want me to be? Now, you can argue about repentance. I'm not going to argue with you about it. You want to come up after church and argue, you, you'll, be, you'll be disappointed because I'm not going to argue with you about it. I'm telling you, you can call it what you want. This fella had the right thoughts in the hog pen, but he didn't get right with his father till he left the hog pen. He had the right thoughts when he said, I've sinned, but he didn't get that thing fixed until he went to the one who could take care of it. He had the right thoughts when he said, I, when I said I need to go home, but he didn't get it fixed until he got home. You can call that what you want, but you're going to have to leave something to come to God. You're going to have to give up something to come to God. It might be, it might be your trust in your church membership. It might be your trust in your good works. It might be, but, but you, you, you're going to have to get from there to here. You have to get from the far country to the Father's house. Let me say something about this Father. This is a picture of how God saves a sinner. You know how this turns out. We'll read it, but you know how it turns out. That father is watching. He's watching every day, hoping for that boy to come home. He is praying every day that that boy will come home. But as much as he loved that boy, he did not leave his clean, pure, holy house to go out there in that hog pen just so he can hang out with that boy. You hear that, brother? I am, I am so sorry for every one of you whose children or grandchildren decide to leave this church and go out in that world. You better stay here. You are not going to help them going out there with them. You understand? And God, let me tell you something about God. I, I, I know, I know, the, the old hymn book. I know the old choir songs. I know the old altar. I know the old Bible preaching. I understand that. But this man did not turn his house into a pig pen so the boy would feel comfortable there while he was living in sin. He kept that house just like it was, hoping that boy would repent and come home one day. And if he didn't, it's the boy's loss. This business of turning the church into a nightclub and turning the church into a rock and roll show and turning the church into some beach party, that is not converting sinners. That's sinners converting churches. The Father's not going to come your way. You've got to come His way. You know what Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life? He didn't say, and the Father cometh to no man but by me. Amen. He said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. God's not moving. Amen. You got to move. Amen. 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 Don't you think God loves sinners? He does, but he doesn't love sin. Right. You want to shack up, you're going to have to make up a new God because the God of the Bible is not going to join you in that. You want to commit adultery, you're going to have to make up a new God. The God of the Bible is not going to join you in that. Do you understand? This modern church that doesn't preach against pig pen living, it's not God's house. It's a trailer down by the hog pen. That, I hope that didn't kill the meeting. It needs to be said. Well, we look around, we say that church is growing. That church is not growing. That club is going. That concert is growing. 
That singles joint is growing. If it's dirty, it's not a church. If it's unholy, it's not a church. They're pouring out slop for hogs, it's not a church. That's right. You see, you preach like that, you won't have any young people. We'll have all young people that want to live right. All right, let's better better get moving on. Get a little, a little heavy in here. So here, here he comes, heading home. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. Came to his father. You know what I like? He didn't come to the house. He didn't come to the fields. He didn't come to the table. He didn't come to the porch. He came to the Father. Amen. You see, when a, when a sinner really, really, really wants to get right with God, Amen. they don't want heaven. They don't want gold streets. They don't want mansions. They don't want pearly gates. They don't want healing. They don't want jobs. They want to be right with God. When he came to his father, hallelujah. Bible says he rose, came to his father, but when he's yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, thank God, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's an unwashed boy he's hugging. That's dirty clothes he's putting his arm around. That's a greasy, bristly face he's putting his lips upon. Oh, the father loved that boy. He loved that boy. He's so glad to see him home. And the son said unto him, Father, listen, he's going to say four things, but he only got to say three. Father, I've sinned against heaven. That was number one. And in thy sight, that was number two. And I'm no more than he called thy son. That's number three. You know what the fourth thing he was going to say was? Make me as one of thy hired servants. But the father cut him off. Because he said, I got enough servants. I want a son. I got enough servants. I want a son. And when you came to God, he didn't receive you because he wanted you to work for him or toil for him or slave for him. He came so he could give you a new birth and make you his child. Hallelujah. As many as received him, they gave him maybe power to become the sons of God. Even them believe on his name. He said, I, he said, I'm going to go tell him, I'll be your servant. And he, he wouldn't even let the words come out of his mouth. Amen. The father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they, they, they began Amen. to be merry. <laughs> now, now think, think with me, think with me. Everything he had coming was given to him before he left home. Right? He spent it all. He's not done one thing to serve or please his father since he left home. So when he gets back, that robe is nothing but grace. He has no right to a robe. He's not earned a robe. But the father says, bring him something he hasn't earned. Bring him something he doesn't deserve and put it on him. You know what that ring is? Completely unmerited. Absolutely undeserved. And the father said, son, give me, oh, quick, quick, quick wash that hand up and wash that hand. And he slid that ring right on the, that boy's finger. And he said, father, I don't deserve this. <laughs> oh, I know that. I'm not giving it to you because you deserve it. I'm giving it to you because I'm glad you're home. Put shoes on his feet. Killed the fatted calf. You, want to, you know, some, you, one, one night, some of you right here in this auditorium, you bowed, you bowed right at one of these benches and you called on Jesus and you asked God to save your soul. And you know what he did? He not only saved your soul, he gave you a home in heaven. He gave you peace. He gave you joy. He gave you hope. He gave you the Holy Ghost. He daily loads you with benefits and you don't deserve any of it. It's just rings and shoes and robes and fatted calves. 
because the Father's glad to have us home. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, three great pictures of how the Son works in salvation, the Spirit works in salvation, the Father works in salvation, completely out of context. But it's good. It's a blessing. Now, you want to know what he's talking about? I'll show you what he's talking about. Look at verse 1, because we, we started in verse 3, which you shouldn't do. We should start verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Wouldn't that be amazing if you announced we're going to continue this meeting and tomorrow night traffic was backed up for miles because all the sinners were coming to hear the words of Jesus. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be amazing? That's what happened here. Every sinner in town is coming to get as close as they can to hear Jesus. Verse 2, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. They were unhappy about all these sinners coming to Jesus. It bothered them that there was such a disruption in the ordinary religious practice of the day. Verse 3, and he spake this parable unto them. You know who he's talking to in Luke 15? People that weren't happy about sinners coming to Jesus. That's who he's talking to. And he tells this story about the, the shepherd finding his sheep. And then he says, verse 6, and when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me. So what was, what was the thrill about finding the sheep? What made it greater? It was that his friends were happy with him and for him that he had found the sheep. You see that? Verse number 7, I say unto you likewise that joy should be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 99 just persons. You know what Jesus said? When one sinner comes to me, Everybody around my father's throne rejoices. Amen. You know who's happy when a man finds his sheep? His friends. Are you a friend of Jesus? Well, yeah, I think so. Okay, let me ask you something. If 99 people are in here on Sunday morning, but there's no lost person here to hear the gospel... If there's 99 people here to enjoy this meeting we've had this week, but nobody walks this aisle and gets saved, there ought to be a level of disappointment in that. There ought to be a tinge of unhappiness in that. I do not want to, to throw any cold water on a revival fire. I, do not, I don't want to take away any of your joy in being faithful church members enjoying all of this, but God said, the same faces every week in their place with their songbook, with their Bible, with their offering doesn't do for me what seeing one sinner come down that aisle and trust Christ does for me. That's what he said. Amen. Now you, you can argue about the other part, but you can't argue about that. There's joy in heaven, more, more joy in heaven. When one sinner repents, then there is 99 people who've already repented. God likes our Sunday school programs. God likes our orphan programs. God likes our Christian schools. God likes our Bible colleges. God likes our choirs. God likes our church services. God likes our pastor preaching the Bible. But I'll tell you what really sets off the party in heaven. Somebody getting saved. That's right. Look, look, come on, keep, keep, stay with me. Look at verse number nine. She found that coin, and when she had found it, she called her friends or neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me. She got her friends. She, they, I found a piece which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Thank God for you nine faithful coins 
Thank God for deacon coins. Thank God for Sunday school teacher coins. Thank God for missionary coins. Thank God for giving coins. Thank God for singing coins. Thank God for musician coins. I saw a man this morning cleaning up all the mess that all of us make. Thank God for clean up people coins. Hallelujah. But angels don't sing when you come to church. And they don't crank up the band up there and, and hallelujah when we have Sunday school. But when somebody gets on their knees and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save my soul, oh, they get with it up there in glory. You know what Jesus said? My friends, my friends are excited about soul winning. My friends are excited about finding the lost and bringing them home. Well, look what he says to them. Verse 20, verse number 25. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. So this was a Methodist home. <laughs> Wouldn't be much dancing in a Baptist house. <laughs> They're carrying on. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brothers come. And thy father killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry. And would not go in. Here's the brother that never went out in the world. Here's the brother that never turned his back on the father. Here's the brother that never spent any time in the pig pen. But in the father's house, he's angry. He's sour. He's got a bad attitude. How about that? Well, I guess it was okay preaching. Somebody sat in my seat, though. Well, I guess they're pretty good singing. That service is so long. <laughs> well, it, it seemed all right, but it, it was. Didn't you think it was hot in there? It was hot in there to me. You know, all this can pass you right by. People be sitting next to you shouting, laughing, waving their hands, enjoying the Lord, and you just sit just as sour as you can be. Oh, I don't want to be. That's who Jesus is talking to. And he says, uh, he was angry, would not go in, therefore came his father out and entreated him. Now, let me tell you something. If you're a prodigal out there in the world, the father ain't coming after you. But if you're an angry child living in the house, he's coming your way. He, he, don't, he don't spank the devil's children, but he'll chase in his. He gets face to face with that angry boy, and, and uh, he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. <laughs> really? Really? And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. Let me tell you something about sour Christians. Let me tell you something about bitter folks sitting in the church house. You start getting cold toward God, you know what you're going to do? You're going to exaggerate your complaints and minimize your blessings. You see what he said? I, ne I never broke one of your commandments. I don't believe that. You never gave me anything. Oh, come on. Well, you start throwing words, around, words like always and never you start throwing those words around, you got something going on in your heart shouldn't be going on. Because it's not always bad. And you're not always passed over. You know what he's saying? He's saying, you, you don't care nothing about me. Why he's provided everything the boy's got in the world. He's living in the father's house. Take a look here. And he said, verse, verse number 30, but as soon as this, thy son was come. He couldn't even say my brother, thy son. Isn't it great that fellow got saved? I don't know if he's saved or not. We'll see. Why don't you go patch things up with that brother? I don't even think he is my brother. You ever heard that stuff? Oh, it happens all the time. Listen, you won't, you won't leave this church because you decide you don't believe in a virgin birth. You'll leave this church because you get bitter over something. 
You won't leave this church because you decided the King James Bible isn't right. You'll leave this church because you, you decided somebody else wasn't doing something right. That elder brother, you know what he's doing? He's standing outside the house. There's a party going on there. There's a celebration going on there. There's a feast going on in there. There's music going on there. There's joy going on there. But he can't stand it. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Now, I've, I've made this mistake. Pastor Logan's made this mistake. Pastor Aiken would never make this mistake. But I have heard, I have heard the prodigal son's accusation preached all my life as though it was fact. Let me ask you something. If, if the elder brother never left home, correct? If the younger brother went into a far country, correct? If the younger brother just got home, that older brother has no idea what he spent his money on. The Bible didn't say he spent his money on harlots. He just made that up. You know what people do when they get bitter? They start making up stuff about preachers. They start making up stuff about church members. They start making up stuff about people who used to be their friends. You know what the problem is? They're just bitter. They're just sour. They're just missing out on all the joy and all the blessing. And Jesus said, here's what he said. To them, he's talking to that crowd. He said unto him, son, thou art ever with me. And all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Amen. All right. I, 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 could go, I could go the rest of the night on this, but I'm, I, I want to I wanna land this plane. Here, listen, church. Listen, listen, please, listen. Your doctrine is right. Thank the Lord. Your Bible version is right. Thank the Lord. Your music is right. Thank the Lord. From what I've seen, your dress is right. Thank the Lord. And this can be the dullest, deadest, coldest, most boring place in town if we don't get interested in what God's interested in, and that's getting lost souls saved. You know you can go through all these motions and just be as dry as dust. You know that. We can do the right thing and just have no excitement or enthusiasm whatsoever. But you start going out there with Jesus and watching him pick up those lost sheep and carry them home, you're going to get excited. You start watching that Holy Ghost shine that light and find those coins and put them back in that pocketbook, you're going to get excited. You start getting in on that music and that singing as the Father rejoices and those prodigals coming home, you're going to get excited. Let me tell you something about our God. I, I'm, I'm a Bible believer. I, I, I listen to preaching on, on that preaching on your radio station. That's, that's, that's my preaching. That's a preaching I've listened to since I got saved. I like that preaching. But I'm going to tell you something right now. We have, those of us believe this Bible, independent Baptist, we have this idea that God is sitting in heaven with his teeth clenched and a scowl on his face and a box of lightning bolts sitting by his side, and he's just up there destroying people day and night because that's what, that's what floats his boat. You know what that Bible said? When one sinner repents, there is joy in the presence of the angels. Isn't that right? Amen. Now let me ask you something. With all the missionaries that your church supports, all the missionaries our church supports, all the missionaries we've never met all over this world, all the gospel tracts that were handed out today, all the radio sermons that were preached today, all the Bibles that were picked up in a motel room today, do you know, you know right now somebody's getting saved? Some, somebody somewhere right now is getting saved. It's Wednesday night. There's Wednesday night church services from one end of this globe to the other. Somebody's getting, wait, wait, somebody else getting saved right now. 
right now. Before I can finish this sentence, somebody in China is getting saved right now. Somebody in India is getting saved right now. Two people in the Philippines are getting saved right now. Somebody in a jail ministry is leading a convict to Christ right now. Some grandma is calling on the Lord in a nursing home ministry right now. Every minute of every day, somewhere in this world, somebody's getting saved. You believe that? You know what the Bible says goes on in the presence of the angels when one sinner repents? Celebration. That means, that means from the day Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of the Father to the rapture, they never stop singing. They never stop shouting. They never stop rejoicing. They never run out of joy around the Father's throne. My independent Baptist brother there is, there is a God of wrath at the second coming and there is a God of wrath at the white throne judgment and there's a God that pours out his wrath in the great tribulation. But I'm telling you right now, we have a God who is full of joy and rejoicing and music and feasting and celebration. And if you're just sour and grumpy and hurling Bible verses at family members all day long, you're missing out on this thing. You know what Jesus got on his Pharisees about? Not failing to have correct doctrine, but failing to be his friend. Because if they were his friends, they would have been excited about sinners coming to Jesus. I want this church to be full of people who are Jesus' friends. People who are excited about souls being saved. People who enjoy souls being saved. It's not a dead, dry missionary report. Look in there. Somebody got saved. Hallelujah. It's not enough. I started to say slideshow. That's how long I've been saved. It's not another DVD presentation from a foreign field. It's cause for rejoicing. Somebody got saved. Hallelujah. Jesus saves, not the church. But when Jesus saves, the church ought to get excited about it. And if the songs have gotten old and you're just going through the routine and the motion and the Bible doesn't mean to you what it used to and the preaching, you can take it or leave it, I'm telling you there's only one cure for it. Get out there and tell people about Jesus. Get out there and tell somebody about the Lord. You'll be amazed at how the party will start in your heart. No substitute for it. No substitute for it. I hear all this stuff about depression and I'm not, I'm not even going down that road. I'm just telling you, until you've tried witnessing, don't try a drug. Amen. Until you've tried witnessing, don't try a pill. Try getting out there every day and telling somebody about Jesus and watch those clouds roll away. Amen. Joy, joy when the shepherd finds a sheep. Joy when the woman finds a coin. Joy when the prodigal son comes home. If you're not enjoying church... Get in on what God enjoys. Amen. If you're not enjoying the Christian life, get in on what Jesus enjoys. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending the good shepherd to find lost sheep and bring them home. Thank you for sending the Holy Ghost to shine the light of truth and bring lost coins home. Thank you for welcoming with open arms the prodigal when they come home. But Father, help us. Help us not to miss the lesson of the chapter. We want to be friends to Jesus and rejoice in the salvation of sinners. Lord, this is a good church and they believe right and they do right. But God, make us a witnessing church. Make us a soul winning church. Make us a going after lost souls and lost sinners church. That we might be filled with joy and rejoicing. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. The pastor's coming.